staring straight at me with a look uh, full of hatred in his eyes. If you come any close, I'll kill you. The ambassador shouts at me. I'll get you with this knight. Do you understand? Say back. Don't be like the ambassador. I tell him as I calmly load a few some bolts into my crossbow, take a few steps towards him. Why? Just shoot him from a distance. I'm sure that somewhere deep down, you always knew it would end that, this way. What are you doing? The ambassador now shouts even louder. I say, step back. Don't you, take, take, uh, don't you dare take another step. Do you not hear me? Stay away from me, you, you, you peasant. No, master, I tell him, as now aim my crossbow at his forehead. You are the peasant. I then shoot the ambassador in the head, killing him before he has a chance to say anything else. As soon as I'm done, I walk out of the house. I head back towards there and others who are waiting impatiently for my return. Oh, good, Darren says, uh, when he sees me, you're back. Come over here, we're all ready to teleport. So, Hadrick says, after I reach him, the master dead, huh? Yep, I say. I feel like I'm gonna miss the poor bastard, Hardrick says. I mean, I still hated his guts, but hearing him shouting his lungs out every time he saw us would always bring will always bring a smile to my face. You know what I'm saying? Don't worry, I tell him. He still lives on in our memories, in your memories, not our memories. That's hilarious. Aye, Hardrick says. And if not him, then his voice surely will. Okay, Barry, you can teleport us now. Uh, says Darren, who is now holding Keldrum's dead body in his arms. While still keeping his transceiver in his right hand. Once everything is ready, uh, we can see the usual white light covering us as our bodies begin to vibrate loudly. And then we find ourselves back in the teleporter room next to Barry Thundercloud and Albert. What happened to kill him? The teleporter guy asks when he sees the dead goblin's dead body in Darren's arm. He sacrificed himself for our sake and for the people in the quarantine area, Darren says in a sad tone. We would not have made it out of their alive, not for him. We are, all in, we are all in his debt. I see, the teleport guy says, he looks away towards the ground. I will take Keldrum back to the waiting room, Albert says. As he approaches Darren, there are many people that would like to say their goodbyes to him, especially in the quarantine area. Make sure that, that he gets a proper burial, Darren says. As he hands Keldrum's body to Albert somewhat hastily. We will do what we will do what we can, Albert says. Then he takes the goblin in his arms. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll need to go report the death of the captain of the guards to our king. I'm certain that he will be both relieved and saddened with the news concerning the long history together. I'll be seeing you later. He then turns invisible along with the goblin's corpse as he presumably heads back towards the rebel base. You know one of the best things about winters is. Is that I can charge my phone while playing something and recording something. Normally my phone would be on heat blast mode. Um, but right now it's much easier to use tech in winters. I don't like winters, don't get me wrong. I really don't like winters. There's a nice area of like spring and autumn where like it's just cold enough where like you can wear a shirt without having being all sweaty and it's just like the perfect temperature. Unfortunately that does not last long in India. It's like 10 months of fucking heat and then 2 months of fucking cold. I fucking hate it but whatever. What can we do about it? Anyway, uh, where were we? You should go back. Is this the next page? We should be going back to the waiting room as well, Darren tells us. See you later, Barry. Thanks for the help. Anytime, the rebel guy says, and then we all leave the teleporter room to head into the tunnel leading towards the rebel base. While we are walking, Darren begins to heal everyone who got hurt during the battle. So, um, Adric says, as Darren is busy healing Layla, I suppose I owe you all an explanation about all those things Gontork said about me while we were fighting. Only if you're ready to talk about it, Darren tells him. Yeah, Hardrick says, as if he looks to be to the side for a second. Yeah, I think I'm ready. So you're finally going to tell them about your ritual with the dwarf village from the borders. Boulders, Haraka says all of a sudden. It's about damn time, if you ask me. Keeping your little secret was really starting to become more trouble than it was worth. You knew? Hardrick asked her dumbfounded. Of course I knew, Haraka says. You seriously think that I would skip your ritual of all people? Your ritual was just obviously the first one I visited. Just so you know that that's two beers you owe me now, dwarf. One for saving you from the ogre captain that one time, another for not spilling the beans. But Gontrok and the dwarven village. The next time I get out of the amulet, get out of this amulet, I'm expecting you to pay up. I, Hardrick says with a half grin. I'll be sure to save up a few dwarven bottles for the occasion. He pauses. Ahem. Hardrick coughs nervously. As he turns towards the rest of us, so where should I begin? You guys remember that one time when I mentioned offhandedly that I was kind of the black sheep of my family? Yes, I remember. Flower says you didn't. You said that the reasons why your family didn't like you had nothing to do with your size. Exactly. 
I took sex. Well, it turns out that the reason for my family hating me is a rather simple one. It's directly related to the events that I was forced to rel relive during the Gods of Trials, Im Gods of Times trial. To start from the beginning, Gontok and some other common fo friends of ours who woke me up one night and they told me about the certain dwarven village that was supposedly being used as a temporary base for a dwarven strike force that was uh, going to attack our base in the next few days. So dwarves are attacking the giants, is that it? There was more than 50 years ago, we were in the pretty nasty war with the dwarves at the time, so I didn't really have a reason to suspect that they would be lying to me about this. So it wasn't a military base then, Darren ask. it was just a regular village. I, Hardrick says, the village in question was nothing more than a regular dwarven small town that didn't have any soldiers in it whatsoever. I probably should have realized that this when I noticed that they didn't even have any lookouts posted during the night, but I fooled myself into thinking that they were just really well hidden and that they could jump out of the bushes to attack us at any time. Gonto convinced me that we needed to take the initiative before they, uh, they had the chance to strike first. He led me to the top of the cliff overseeing the valley in which the village was located. The reason why he took us all the way up there was because of some huge boulders that was placed right at the top that were too big to be moved by anyone other than the giants like us. He wanted us to push them off their cliff simultaneously so that they would roll all the way down to the village and destroy the houses before any of the villagers had time to react. So that's what your ritual was about, Kate says in a serious tone. Yes, Hardrick says in a somewhat hesitant voice. To complete the trial, I had to push the boulders down that cliff just like the first time and to kill all those innocent people again. Obviously, I don't know. This was this at first, just like you guys, I thought that this was my one chance to change my mistakes from the past. It took me a long while to understand that what the ritual actually wanted from me. It took me even longer to realize I had to reenact everything what hap that happened. Not just the boulder pushing, so I actually had to go down to the village and check every single village house for non-existent survivors, getting a close look at every single one of the people I've killed, including the women and children, not exactly the best experience to have. Considering how hard I've been trying to forget those faces after they have haunted my dreams for years. My gods, that's horrible, Flower says, but how did th this lead to you having a fight with your parents? Now, as you can imagine, when I came back to our camp after this event, I was absolutely devastated, Hardrick says. The first thing I tried to do was to go to my camp leader in order to turn myself in along with my friends for the war crimes they have committed. The leader pretty much laughed in my face, telling me that our war crimes rules only applied for wars with other clans of giants, not for our ongoing war with the dwarves. He also told me that these children would have probably grown up, become, grown up to become soldiers later anyway, so it, it was still to take them out while they were still young. That was the first time when I realized how differently our people would treat the concept of honor when it comes to races other than giants. Obviously, I couldn't just let this go and tried to get justice for those dead dwarves. Although every means at my disposable, the, disposal, the f other giants thought I was joking at first. But when they understood that I was being serious, they began to treat me as a lot more coldly, calling me dwarf sympathizer, saying that I can no longer have the right to call myself a warrior. I've taken the side of the enemy. He said he, could, he tried to get justice any means at his disposal. What does that mean? Did he attack the giants? Uh, something? Now that is a very dark story. I mean, I'm kind of getting used to these dark stories. Everyone has like a different level of dark story. But yeah, this is, this is kind of fucked up. It kind of reminded me of that scene from uh, Saga of Tanya the Evil. When it's like, you see those uh, people, the refugees or whatever they were. Um, you know, you see the hatred in their eyes when they grow up. They're going to be soldiers. They will attack the empire. And then she, she gets one of her comrades to shoot them. Oh man, that's such a brutal scene. <laughs> uh, they really did a good job with that show, honestly. Like, who would expect like a middle-aged man to be in the body of a child and behaving like this? He was very much he was very much so nonchalant when he was in the advanced world. Very interesting. Is that why Gondok said your parents think you've lost your honor? Darren says. Not only because of this, but it was part of the reason, yes. Hardrick says the other part of the reason was the fact that when I realized I couldn't get any justice for the dead dwarves by staying with my clan, I decided to go on a self-imposed exile, shapeshifting myself into a dwarf so that I could infiltrate the dwarven lands, track down the remaining relatives of the innocent civilians I killed in the village. Obviously, leaving the clan for a reason like this would pretty much guarantee that I would no longer be welcome if I ever chose to come back. 
This didn't matter to me though because all I wanted to do was to do was make things right. Did you manage to find any of those relatives in the end? I did, uh, Darren said, Hardrick said. 